All right. Um, yeah, so welcome and, and thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to try to take you through um, uh, a little bit of the history of ethnographic and documentary film, um, which runs through Harvard. And um, I'm going to show you some films from uh, Harvard professors that were, um, you know, from maybe the 1960s through um, 2007. Um, and there's a very, very strong tradition of ethnographic and documentary film at Harvard. And Harvard really made a lot of significant contributions um, to the field um, and, uh, and to the body of work um, that's out there. So um, we'll start with um, going through um, a little bit of, uh, of where it all started in the 60s. And then we're going to um, step back to um, Robert Flaherty and uh, Nanook of the North and then move our way forward. Um, and we're going to look at a fair amount of clips. Um, so I hope to, to give you a very um, brief sort of whirlwind tour of uh, documentary and ethnographic film um, with a strong emphasis on what happened in Harvard. So a lot of what happened with uh, ethnographic and documentary film was really impacted by uh, technologically, uh, technological um, uh, improvement in cameras. And uh, the CP16, um, this was the camera that we used when I was an undergraduate. This was a camera that started to be made in the 1960s. Um, it was portable, it was lightweight, it could shoot synchronous sound. Um, it held 400 foot film loads, which could record about 11 minutes. Um, and so all of a sudden you were freed from extremely heavy equipment, from needing tripods, um, from uh, not being able to shoot. Uh, you know, if you wanted to be portable in the past, you would have to uh, shoot non-synchronous um, film. Um, and so this made a huge difference. Um, these were newsreel cameras uh, for the most part, and they were used ubiquitously through the, the 60s and 70s as newsreel cameras but uh, they really, really changed the face of documentary cinema. Um, what we're gonna look at is uh, a movement that started in France called Cinema Verite, um, which translates as film truth, and which got um, sort of reimagined in the United States as direct cinema. So these films, they really sort of uh, linger between what was a traditional documentary and fiction. And we're gonna see that when I show you a clip of Nanook of the North, we're gonna see that very, very early on. Um, where Nanook of the North is using the, the language of narrative film. The, uh, the emphasis on cinema verite and on direct cinema was to try to strip away some of the conventions of documentary filmmaking um, so that you would get a more real or more immediate truth um, and put truth in quotation marks um, because what constitutes truth um, has been uh, the topic of uh, endless conversations about documentary. Um, I think direct cinema, which is um, what was it was referred to in the United States, is a better term um, because it tries to put the viewer in more direct contact with the action that's taking place in front of the camera um, and also to make clearer the relationship between the person who's making the film and the subjects. Um, so that was the other goal is to eliminate the barriers between subjects uh, and audience to try to, uh, if you could reduce that, reduce it, but if you couldn't reduce it to at least lay your cards on the table and reveal your process. Um, and the idea was to re rediscover a reality that uh, was missing from a lot of other forms of filmmaking. And you're gonna have to go back in time a little bit now because these techniques are so ubiquitous now. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the commercialization of uh, cinema verite and what's currently known as reality television. Um, and this now is, is really uh, so commonplace, um, but you have to go back in time and, and realize that this was uh, a very new way of thinking about and making films, um, you know, back in the 60s and 70s when this was done. And there was a lot of interaction between ethnographic filmmakers, which had a more anthropological focus and, uh, and other forms of documentary filmmakers. So we're gonna go back to Robert Flaherty and we're gonna start with, um, with Nanook of the North. Um, you probably have heard of Nanook of the North. You might've seen Nanook of the North. Um, it's from 1922, and it's, it was really one of the first commercially successful films. And we're going to look at why that was. And it, it really, like I said, is because he's used in the language of narrative film. So this was called salvage ethnography because really uh, the lifestyle that Flaherty was catching in 19, uh, capturing in 1922 was disappearing. And, um, and salvage ethnography is an idea of uh, recording and documenting um, a, a style of life or a way of life that, um, that is uh, disappearing. Um, uh, the key thing is uh, the recording of folklore um, and cultures threatened with extinction. I wanted to focus on the word recording um, because we're going we're to talk about that a fair amount. What is 
The idea is that he was just recording what was happening. And that's where the essence of film truth comes in is that we are recording rather than we are um, manufacturing. We're, not, we're, we're recording what's happening. We're not creating what's happening. But I wanna show you a clip of Nanook of the North. So there is a soundtrack um, that was added to this, but it was a silent film when it was made. Um, so I'm gonna turn the sound off because I much prefer it silent. Um, and so uh, we're going to watch the clip and then we'll talk about it a little bit. It's only, uh, it's, it's, I'm not going to go all seven minutes. We're just going to watch for a little bit. So there's a few things I'd like to point out about this clip. As I mentioned, Flaherty uses the language of narrative cinema. And there's a couple of techniques that we can look at. The first is he uses cross-cutting uh, to imply that the action is taking place simultaneously. So the boy is sledding while Nanook is building the igloo. Uh, he even has the title card, While Father Works. Um, the other technique that he uses is uh, the close-up. And the close-up was really something that was used primarily in narrative cinema. And of course, it brings us closer to the characters and gives us a connection with the character. Um, in this case, Nanook's wife and child. Um, now, this was a very big camera. It took a long time to set up. Um, so none of this was sort of captured spontaneously. Um, uh, Flaherty um, would ask uh, Nanook to do certain things for him and, uh, and they would prepare in advance and then Nanook would do it. Um, even so, um, you can notice with the equipment of the day, the shot where Nanook is building the igloo, we can see that the exposure on Nanook's face is, uh, is a little dark. We can't really see the details of his face very well. And this is simply, um, you know, the, uh, the time, the cameras, the film stock, it's a bright day, the snow is very reflective. And if he would have set the exposure for, Nan for Nanook's face, he would sort of blow out, blow out the rest of the frame. Um, and so even with these large heavy equipments, the film stocks in 1922 are not um, what we have today. Um, <clears throat> one of the scenes that I think looks really constructed to me is the scene with the boy playing with the small sled and, and the puppy. Um, this seems to me to be a very constructed scene. Um, I, I doubt that's the boy, the way the boy plays by himself when he's on his own. And in fact, at the beginning of the shot, you can see the father sort of walk uh, Nanook sort of walk in the direction that he wants the boy to go. So that, that seems very constructed. But um, I think one of the reasons for the popularity of this film is that Flaherty really relates Nanook um, to the audience. Um, he finds the, the common humanity. 
um, you know, the, the uh, title card about how the baby finds the task of bore. Um, and, and I think the idea is that we can all relate to a family that's at work and play together. Um, so none of, none of the ideas of the construction of the scenes, um, I think, takes away from the film. It's really a marvelous film. Um, but even as early as 1922, it starts to introduce the questions of who is taking the film, what is their relationship to the subject, what is the autonomy of the subject in terms of controlling how and what they're filmed, uh, how they're filmed and, and the content of how they're filmed or even how that film is gonna be put together. Uh, so we're gonna jump from Nanook of the North all the way from 1922 to 1961. And um, we are going to take a look at Jean Rouge. <clears throat> Jean Rouge was one of the pioneers of the cinema verite movement. Um, his most famous film um, is called Chronicle of a Summer from 1961, and this was uh, made in collaboration with the sociologist Edgar Moran. And um, the idea here was to combine improvisation with the use of the camera to reveal a hidden truth. In other words, the people who um, were being filmed were interacting in, a, in real time with the people who were making the film, and uh, there's, an, the, there's an interviewer who's caught uh, on film. And the idea of this was that it was called shared anthropology, or that filmmaking was a collaborative venture. So rather than making an ethnographic film, which Roosh had certainly done in the past, in this case, he, he even talks about, um, uh, in the brief interview, you'll see uh, filming the tribe of people as, as known as sort of the modern French uh, uh, the French of his own day, the French people of his own day. And, um, uh, and, uh, but he is asking for their collaboration in the film um, rather than just kind of standing back and filming it as he would an ethnographer. So let's take a look at this clip. The camera's catalyst has its own history. In 1960, the sociologist Edgar Morin proposed to anthropologist Jean Rouge that they make a film looking at the tribe of people living in Paris. Ce film n'a pas été vécu par des hommes et des femmes qui ont donné des moments de leur existence à une expérience nouvelle de cinéma vérité. And this idea to make uh, to consider my concitoyens as uh, people that you can study as you do it in uh, anthropology was a sort of wonderful idea. Tu vois Morin, euh, l'idée de réunir des gens autour d'une table est une excellente idée. Seulement, je ne sais pas si nous arriverons à enregistrer une conversation aussi normale qu'elle le serait s'il n'y avait pas de caméra. We decided to make a film without any script, without any scenario. The only idea would be uh, what, what is your life? The question would be, are you happy? Êtes-vous heureux? Monsieur, s'il vous plaît, êtes-vous heureux Je me dis, qu'est-ce que ça peut vous foutre S'il vous plaît, êtes-vous heureux N'ayez pas peur, on ne veut pas vous faire de mal. Rouge Morin's film is an altogether different kind of documentary. Not a story of what might have happened if the camera hadn't been there, but a story of what happens because the camera is there. Pourquoi vous êtes malheureux, monsieur Parce que je suis trop vieux. C'est vrai Oui, 79 ans. Non. Apparent, si. Je suis 82. Et vous pensez... <laughs> non, n'ayez pas peur, c'est le micro. C'est le micro. It was a kind que... of uh, uh, research in which the human beings, the people we film, were not objects. They were subjects of the film. They were human beings. So there's a lot to talk about in this clip. I think uh, one of the most important comments is the comment, is it possible to film a conversation without affecting the situation or without affecting the conversation that you're trying to film? Uh, in other words, how can we capture reality without the process of filmmaking affecting the situation that we're trying to film? And I think this is really the, the crux of, um, of this film um, and, uh, and really the crux of some of the ideas behind the cinema verite movement. Um, so if you compare this to Flaherty's concept of recording, the idea that if you turn on a camera, you can neutrally capture what's happening, uh, we know that this is really not the case. And uh, the impact of the camera on the situation, um, in, in the case of this film, becomes the subject of the film. Um, uh, they're trying to capture a new truth, which is the, the truth of making a film 
um, the truth of making a film about uh, these people in a collaborative manner. Um, it's hard to go back in time and imagine that, um, you know, person in the street interviews was uh, groundbreaking um, filmmaking or groundbreaking sociology. Um, uh, and that's where, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so many of the techniques of documentary film are now that have been developed over the years are now just so commonplace, um, we don't even really think about them. Um, but there was a lot of thought from, uh, from the perspective of sociology and ethnography that went into um, the making of this film. So, uh, but, but I think the main shift here from uh, Flaherty to uh, Jean Rouge is the idea of moving from uh, simply recording reality um, to uh, acknowledging the presence of the camera uh, changing or creating a new reality. And, um, and in the case of this film, making that the subject of the film. But I think after this film and after the cinema verite movement um, opened up this conversation, um, the filmmakers going forward would have to acknowledge um, in some way, their relationship to the subject matter, and in some way, try to acknowledge the way that the making of the film had impacted the film. So let's move uh, on um, from Jean Rouge. We're going to move uh, to Harvard, but we're going to go by way of MIT. So Richard Leacock was the uh, one of the pioneers of the American cinema verite movement. And cinema verite in the United States um, was called direct cinema, which as I mentioned earlier, I think is a, a more accurate um, uh, name for, for what was really going on here um, with, with this style of filmmaking. Um, uh, Richard Leacock was the driving force behind, behind the MIT film program. And um, it was really the MIT film program that, um, that uh, uh, educated, trained um, a lot of the um, filmmakers who uh, would move to Harvard and um, would teach at Harvard in the 70s and the 80s. Um, and I think um, uh, much of what um, I studied and much of the program at Harvard really um, originated with Richard Leacock and also the next person that we'll discuss, um, Robert Gardner, are the two sort of pillars on which uh, the film department at Harvard um, grew out of um, into the 70s and the 80s. Um, so Richard Leacock worked with Robert Flaherty on um, one of the later films that he made called Louisiana Story. Um, and uh, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about um, his work as a cinematographer on uh, Robert Drew's milestone documentary, Primary. Um, this was a documentary about the um, Kennedy campaign. Um, and um, we're going to look at this and talk about um, the cinematography um, specifically and talk about how um, uh, the cinematography of this era, um, you know, that was aided by the portable cameras, the CP16, um, really started to give us a new view on the world and contributed to this idea of um, um, film truth or direct cinema. Um, so let's take a look at this clip from Primary and then we will discuss um, some of the cinematography afterwards. This is the heart of Senator Kennedy's strength. The heavily populated city areas, particularly the Polish Catholic 4th District in Milwaukee.
So what I'd like to talk about is the long shot um, that uh, starts with Kennedy um, making his way through the crowd, uh, going all the way through the, the crowd, um, shaking hands, greeting people. Um, he arrives at the staircase um, uh, that takes him to the stage, goes up the staircase, walks onto the stage, faces the audience, um, and, and we as the viewer go all the way with Kennedy through the crowd, up the staircase, onto the stage. Um, now, this would be a marvelous shot in any film, um, uh, documentary or fiction. Um, but the fact that, um, that he shot this in a documentary uh, setting or a documentary context is really nothing short of miraculous. Um, it's not the kind of thing like in a narrative film where you would um, uh, set the lighting, um, uh, you know, talk to all the extras so they knew exactly what they were doing um, and rehearse it a number of times until you got it right. Um, this was something that was occurring in real time. Um, and uh, I want to point out a few things. So first of all, you'll notice the depth of field. Um, in other words, that we have focus from uh, very close um, on Kennedy, everything's uh, in sharp focus, um, all the way into the background. Um, and so um, in order to get that kind of depth of field, you need to close down your aperture. Um, you know, he's shooting at, um, you know, probably F11, F16, depending on his lens. Um, and um, so that just seems to have worked with the lighting situation. Um, you can tell he stopped down a bit because when the flash bulbs go off, it's not excessively bright. So the camera does seem to be stopped down a bit. Um, but to once again, uh, take the meter reading of that room, um, you know, and you're also moving from, uh, you know, um, below the stage up and on to, to the stage. So the exposure is great. The depth of field is great. But more importantly, um, you have sort of a high angle um, on, uh, you're looking down over Kennedy's head a bit. And um, so uh, one can only imagine that, um, that this camera was being held over, um, over uh, Richard Leacock's head. And you can see another um, uh, uh, photographer, filmmaker in the background, probably a news uh, cameraman um, doing the same thing. Um, what that means is that he wasn't really looking through the eyepiece um, at the time that he took the shot. Um, and so in real time, he's uh, sort of watching the crowd, aiming the camera, um, responding. He doesn't know whether Kennedy's going to turn left or right, responding to what's happening. Um, now, we get a, a wonderful piece of good fortune, which is that as Kennedy, Kennedy's walking up the stairs, um, where you would normally just get the back of his head, somebody calls out to Kennedy and he turns around and greets them. And you get this wonderful profile from down low. Um, and then all the way up on the stage and the crowd starts spontaneously singing. Um, you just couldn't plan it better. Um, and the fact that it wasn't, um, you know, planned, the fact that this was captured in a documentary setting is really quite extraordinary. Um, and uh, so I want you just to be able to appreciate that kind of shot because we see a lot of that kind of shot now in narrative films. And, um, uh, but it's a very difficult um, kind of shot to take in the field. And once again, coming back to the theme of direct cinema, it really puts you in Kennedy's shoes. You walk with him through the crowd onto the stage. And I think that um, that gives you a view of, uh, of the campaign, a view of quote unquote reality that not a lot of people had had, had before. And once again, you have to put yourself back in time a bit. I mean, we've seen so many on the campaign trail type, um, you know, movies and stories uh, on the news now that they're very commonplace. But I think um, this was uh, really quite remarkable, um, and uh, and I think just the um, the the technical um, expertise and the way that this is shot really contributes to um, it communicating visually um, and um, you know getting away from sort of the talking heads or the bland narrators um, and putting you in the scene and giving you a, giving you a direct experience. So let's move on from uh, Richard Leacock uh, to uh, Robert Gardner. Robert Gardner was uh, the founder of the film program at Harvard. Uh, he started the Peabody Museum's Film Study Center in 1955, um, and Gardner was an anthropologist, and as an anthropologist, he was looking to use cinema to interrogate and understand the world, um, but his films are just so well made. Uh, in my mind, uh, they sort of create a new genre, uh, which is poetic anthropology. Um, uh, they're just uh, really, really um, beautiful and immersive films. 
I'm going to show you a clip um, from one of his best known films um, called Forest of Bliss. Uh, Forest of Bliss is a portrait of daily life in Varanasi, um, which uh, is one of the world's holiest cities. Um, and this is really an amazing film, uh, one that had a significant impact on me as an undergraduate. Uh, we're going to watch the opening and then we'll uh, discuss it. So Varanasi is a city in which um, uh, dead bodies are, are brought for uh, Hindu burial rites. Um, and so this is a film about religion. It's a film about death. Um, it's about ceremony. Um, and the opening really brings all of these elements together. Um, the cinematography, um, the editing, the pace of the film, um, it's really a, a remarkable achievement. But um, we see images at the beginning that we don't necessarily understand and we don't know how to interpret. Uh, like the water when we first see it. Um, it's very abstract and it's uh, just barely light. Um, but when we see the boat, um, and we're able to connect the boat to the sound of the oars. We start to develop a picture in our mind of a place, um, but it's not yet a complete picture. Uh, we're taking those images and sounds and we're starting to put the pieces together um, like we would if we were just sort of dropped into Varanasi at sunrise and started to look around and observe. Um, and I think this is a, a lot of the great strength of the film is that it puts the viewer into the perspective of someone um, who, is, uh, who is almost there and experiencing um, what's going on around them. May not understand it all um, from an ethnographic perspective. Um, there's no narration. Um, it's really meant to be an experiential um, film. I'll relate this idea um, uh, toward the end of the lecture uh, when we look at the sensory ethnography lab um, at Harvard um, now, because I think there's a, um, some interesting parallels between um, the way Forest of Bliss works and, uh, and what's going on with the sensory ethnography lab. Now we're gonna move forward to my time at Harvard. Um, I was there in the 1980s, and uh, we're gonna take a look at the three filmmakers who were teaching um, at that time. Uh, all of them are extraordinary filmmakers um, and ones that uh, continue to work. Um, I'm going to start with Ross McElwee um, and the personal documentary. Um, Ross really took the personal documentary to another level. Um, and it's not even where he's revealing his interactions with the subject, 
Um, he really is the subject of a lot of his films. And so rather than capturing some truth about the world, Ross is exploring a personal truth by interacting with the world from behind the camera. Uh, let's take a look at the opening scene from Sherman's March, and then we can, dis um, then we can discuss it in more detail. In 1864, during the American Civil War, Union General William T. Sherman began his famous March to the Sea. With an army of 60,000 men, he swept into the South, destroying Atlanta, Georgia, Columbia, South Carolina, and dozens of smaller towns. His troops plundered homes, destroyed livestock, burned buildings, and left a path of destruction 60 miles wide and 700 miles long, before finally forcing a Confederate surrender in North Carolina. Sherman's campaign marked the first time in modern history that total warfare had been waged on a primarily civilian population, and traces of the scars he left on the South can still be found. Great. Do you want to do it once more? Just do it all, yeah. <clears throat> Two years ago, I was about to begin shooting a documentary film on the lingering effects of Sherman's march on the South. I'm from the South, and all through my childhood, I heard stories about how Sherman had devastated the South. My aunt even keeps a sofa in her attic, which is punctured by sword holes put there by Sherman's soldiers as they searched for hidden valuables. She says she'll never allow the holes to be sewn up. Anyway, I'd just gotten a grant to make my film, and I stopped off in New York from Boston, where I live, to stay for a few days with the woman I'd been seeing. But when I arrived, she told me she'd just decided to go back to her former boyfriend. We argued, and then I left, and went to stay alone in a friend's studio loft, which happened to be vacant at the time. Finally, I headed south to see my family and to try to begin my film. So Russ is first and foremost a terrific filmmaker. Uh, the film starts like a PBS documentary with a typical narrator recounting the history of Sherman's March uh, with the map on the screen. But we soon learn that even though Ross has received a grant to make a film about Sherman's March, the events in his personal life have changed his plans. This clip therefore becomes the point of departure, both uh, for Ross's personal journey, but also for the film stylistically. Uh, the next scene um, in his friend's unfinished loft in New York uh, the room is empty, the walls are unpainted, and uh, Ross films himself at a distance. Um, he's small in the frame. When he walks in front of the window, which is too bright, the image blurs. Um, he's sort of alone and lost in an empty space. And these two scenes set us up for the personal journey that he constructs. Um, first, we see the film that Ross is supposed to be making, which sets up a stylistic contrast with the film that he's actually making. Um, but I want to stress that uh, the Ross McAwee who was making the film um, and the Ross McAwee who was the main character um, of his film and of many of films um, is, is just it, are not the same. Uh, Ross creates a version of himself um, uh, and chooses to reveal um, what, he, what he wants to reveal about himself um, for, for a given film to make that film work narratively and structurally. Um, here, film truth is more of an emotional truth. Um, the film succeeds uh, to, the, to the degree that we accept Ross's journey as emotionally honest, um, even though it, it's definitely constructed. Um, and once again, I think Ross is just a terrific filmmaker and it's, it's beautifully constructed. Um, Ross has a large body of work. Um, and as you watch more and more of his films, um, there are people and characters that will reoccur um, you get to know um, people in his family and people in his life. Um, you get different perspectives on them at different times in his life. 
Um, uh, but taken together, um, these films represent a really incredible body of work, um, both personally and stylistically. Uh, next, we're gonna look at Rob Moss. Um, Rob uh, has also made a number of terrific films um, and he will sometimes use the passage of time um, uh, to reflect on his characters and his stories. And I'm gonna show you um, a clip uh, from a film called The Same River Twice. Um, uh, to set this up, when Rob was a young filmmaker, he made a film called River Dogs about a trip um, he took down the Colorado River at the end of the season with um, the other river guides. And this was the 1970s and the guides are enjoying sort of the freedom of youth and the freedom of their generation. Um, and then many years later, Rob um, goes back um, and films the same characters to follow up um, where, you know, to see where their lives have led them um, over the intervening years. When you look at Danny, do you think, well, she has kids and they could have been mine? Uh, yeah, but, uh, let's see, I was, I was doing other stuff right then. She, and she, I, I really, I'm glad she had children, but, I don't wish they were mine, really. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad she had them. I would think she's a great mom and that they have a really good family and they're in a good place and that life is good. <laughs> We related to Jim as a river deity. The cultural norms said, follow Jim, do what Jim does. We were Jimists. Jim was sort of the composite of who we were and who we were trying to be. It was all sort of boiled down in efficient form in Jim. I spent the first day during that trip worrying about the unfinished business I'd left behind. But slowly slid into the rhythm of the river. There is something so soothing and so physically powerful and so rhythmic and so blended about a river and the channel it runs through and the canyon around it. This is a personal film as well, and Rob participates in the film as a filmmaker. Um, he's both a participant and the filmmaker, but his role is, is very different than um, Ross's role in his films. Um, he's more of an observer and an interviewer. Um, uh, the truth we're getting here comes from looking back and reinterpreting the past, um, looking at these images that were shot over 20 years ago to understand them with the perspective of time. Um, and this is another kind of film truth, uh, to be able to compare these moments from the past um, with the events that followed. Um, it's in some ways not unlike the 7-Up series, um, in which we get to watch characters grow and change over time. Uh, but I think this is a very, very powerful um, and moving film. Um, and with all the films I've shown you clips from tonight, um, I would highly recommend um, that you watch them if you can get your hands on them. Last but not least, uh, for my professors, um, is Alfred Guzzetti. Um, now, Alfred is not strictly a documentary filmmaker, 
Um, he's worked on a lot of different films over the years, and he's uh, better known as an experimental filmmaker these days. Um, but uh, he has worked on a number of documentaries. Um, he's also an excellent cinematographer, and he shot one of the films um, we'll be discussing later this evening, um, which is called Singing Pictures. Um, Alfred uh, was particularly um, supportive of me in my work when I started making films after graduation. Uh, just very generous um, with his time and very encouraging. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip um, from a film called Pictures from a, Revo uh, Pictures from a Revolution. Um, and this is a film that he made with um, Susan Mazelis and Richard Rogers. Um, Susan Mazelis is a documentary photographer. Um, and uh, she also worked with Fred Wiseman as an editor after graduating from Harvard um, on, uh, on basic training. Um, Richard Rogers was also a professor in the VES department, um, but that was after my time. Um, and he also made some terrific films. Um, so this film, like a lot of projects that came out of Harvard, was a collaboration between um, you know, different artists and professors who were working there. Um, to set this clip up and the film up, Susan um, was in Nicaragua um, as a photographer um, during the Sandinista Revolution um, in 1978, uh, 1979. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you the beginning of the film, so that should be all the setup we need. Um, and uh, let's take a look. When I first went to Nicaragua, I never imagined that I'd spend the next 10 years or more photographing there. By chance, I arrived right before the insurrection in June 78, when everything was about to erupt. I got up every day without a plan and just photographed what I saw. History was being made on the streets and no one knew where it would lead. People believed what they were doing mattered. I felt the necessity to witness and document what they did. Within a year, Somoza and his National Guard were overthrown and the fighting ended. I went through the thousands of pictures I'd made and picked 70 to put into a book. It was a time of hope, and I felt in some way part of it. Then everything got more complicated. The years passed. Instead of peace, there was another war, a contra war. There was forced conscription, hardship, and pain. Now I want to retrace my steps, to go back to the photos I took at the time of the insurrection and search for the people in them. What brought them to cross my path at the moment they did? What's happened to them since? What do they think now? What do they remember? So this film, like the same river twice, um, takes an event which was documented at a specific uh, point in time and then revisits that uh, event um, to follow up on the people involved and also to try to get at um, sort of a, a deeper truth or another perspective of this event by, by visiting it from, um, from uh, you know, a, another time after, after a significant amount of time has passed. Um, in this case, the event is political, not personal, um, although Susan does discuss her experiences um, shooting the photographs during the revolution. Um, but one thing I, I want to point out that I think is really clever about the editing of the opening sequence um, is I think it's interesting that we have these incredible photographs um, and uh, they're shown very briefly during this introduction. Um, and uh, the first time I saw this film, I found myself wanting to slow it down, you know, so I could take time and, and process these images and really look at them. Um, and in a way, uh, this is a great evocation of uh, Susan's experience shooting the photographs. Um, you know, everything happened very quickly um, and it took her a fair amount of time to sift through the images uh, and try to make sense of it all. Um, and then we get to go back later and, um, and follow up with the characters. And so it, it puts the viewers sort of in a similar experience where um, this event happens and these photographs um, sort of flash by. Um, but then we get to go back, um, we get to linger over these images, we get to learn about some of the people in the photographs. Um, and I think it's just a really um, terrific um, uh, film. I think it's a great opening uh, for this film um, because it, it puts the viewer into a similar experience um, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Susan as she, made, as she took these photographs. So now we're going to jump um, closer to the present um, and we're going to look at the sensory ethnography lab at Harvard. Um, so this is not exclusively a film lab. Um, uh, the lab uh, very explicitly um, tries to work in a variety of media, 
Uh, and the goal is to explore innovative combinations of aesthetics and, eth and ethnography. And so, you know, we've really come a long way from Nanook of the North um, to where the objective um, is more experimental, more aesthetic. Uh, we've moved beyond the idea of documenting the world um, as it is uh, to the idea of creating an experience of the world, um, to try to explore the ontology of the world um, through aesthetics, uh, exploration, and media. Um, we're going to take a look at a film by uh, Lucien Castang Taylor and uh, Verena Paraval, uh, which is called Leviathan. I want to point out that um, technology is once again playing a role in the development of the language of documentary film. Uh, you know, much of this film was shot with um, small digital waterproof cameras um, that are capable of shooting hours and hours of continuous footage. Uh, so you could simply mount them on the boat uh, and turn them on and, and just let them run um, for, for the entire voyage. Um, and uh, that was certainly not possible um, before we were shooting, um, you know, digital media. Um, I think these shots are, are really extraordinary. Um, I showed these clips because I think this film, um, you know, is, is when I first saw it, it was once again, something really new and something that, um, you know, really grabbed my attention and, and opened my eyes as to uh, what was possible with, with filmmaking and documentary filmmaking. Um, and it really gives us a unique experience of the subject matter. Uh, I love seeing, um, you know, sort of the awful sliding off the boat into the water initially, um, and then following that up with uh, um, a shifting of perspective uh, where we're both sort of underwater and above water. Um, and, uh, you know, it's almost like we're in the water with the awful. And, uh, and then there's that first moment where we surface and, and all the seagulls are above us. Um, and uh, I just think that's a really terrific um, way of, uh, of exploring that material. Um, I myself shot a film in Newfoundland, um, and I spent uh, a number of days um, filming on fishing vessels, um, but I never imagined um, shooting it like this or capturing this type of experience. Um, so uh, I, I think it's just a great film. Um, once again, really worth watching. Um, and I also think it's great to see that Harvard really continues to make uh, significant contributions to the documentary and uh, the development of uh, documentary and ethnographic film over time. Um, and I hope uh, now you can see 
um, something like Leviathan as an extension of the work um, of a, a number of really, really talented artists and professors uh, working over a long period of time. Um, the last topic I want to touch on um, is, uh, is the commercialization of documentary, um, what we would currently call reality television. Um, and Harvard also played a role here. Um, a filmmaker named Alec Kashishian, who was uh, a year ahead of me, made a very successful commercial film in 1991 called Truth or Dare um, about Madonna. Um, and I'm going to show you a clip um, from the film. Uh, I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm not going to show you a clip from the film, uh, but rather I'm going to show you a clip of Alec talking about the film uh, from MTV. Um, and then we'll um, discuss this clip and, uh, and the film a little bit more. The film, he'd only actually made a few promos previous to that. She'd seen some of the films he'd made while at uh, film school at Harvard and some of the promos. However, he wasn't intimidated, apparently, by Madonna's request, and he had a few ideas of his own about what he wanted to do with the film. Here he is talking about it. I said, if you really want me to document the tour, then that means giving me complete access to really document it and not telling me when to turn the cameras on and off and not telling me where and when I can shoot. And I said, and I don't really think you're prepared to do that. So I went home that, that evening thinking I'd talked her out of my job, at least on the documentary side of the stuff. And said the next day when I got to the rehearsal, she said, okay, I've thought about it. I want to do the documentary part too. And I was like, okay, as long as you realize I'm going to be there when you wake up, I'm going to be there when you go to sleep, I'm going to be there when you don't have makeup on, I'm going to be there when you don't want me to be there. She said, okay. So what Alec has done here, um, or what he did, was to take um, a lot of the ideas and some of the aesthetics that he learned um, in the film department at Harvard and applied them to celebrity. Uh, and I think this was really smart um, because the thrill for the audience is the idea of seeing um, or getting to know a celebrity, uh, the sense that you're really getting to know them, that you're, you're seeing them um, off stage. Um, and using the language of cinema verite, um, you know, gives us the illusion of a greater intimacy. Um, and, uh, you know, we see Madonna in a, in a, in a way when she's not performing for the camera. Um, and, um, and this was a really effective hook for the audience. Um, now, you know, of course, Madonna had, uh, you know, I'm sure full control over what ended up in the film. And um, I think this, uh, this sense of, um, of, a, of a, you know, deeper, more personal, more intimate portrait of Madonna is, um, you know, is largely constructed and, and uh, um, uh, you know, but, but that doesn't matter uh, in a way because, because the idea of the film was to, was to sell that, that intimacy. And I think it did that extremely well. Um, I think you can draw, you know, a pretty straight line from this film to, um, to a lot of the uh, celebrity reality TV shows today, um, Keep Up with Kardashians and um, uh, others. Uh, I don't watch reality television all that much. Um, so last topic, um, I want to talk, um, uh, show one more clip and speak a little bit in detail um, about um, a film that I worked on as an editor called Singing Pictures. Singing Pictures was made by Akos um, Esther and uh, Lena Frusetti. Um, and uh, Alfred Guzetti, um, as I mentioned earlier, was the cinematographer. Um, they also worked with an ethnographer um, in India. Um, and uh, Akos uh, um, also worked with um, Robert Gardner on Forest of Bliss. Um, uh, so, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of connections. Um, this film takes place in a um, uh, village uh, in Bengal. And um, I'm not going to say too much to set it up. I'm going to show you the clip. I'm going to show you two clips, actually. Um, and then we will discuss those clips. And um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about some of the editing choices that were made. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to wrap up. Sonene sonen saru bojan, sonene diya mano. Oil ter senta dhong shor kotha, kori ni bedon. Agaroi September, Mongol bar. Oil ter senta dhong holo. Pure holo char kar, 
शत शत मानुष के निये जाए हासपताले कारो पा कारो हाथ को बात दे बे डाक्तर बोले मले ही काज के खोरे लो भेबे तुम्र बोलो भाई विशे सो गोरा सब भाब छे तारा सर बोदाई एमेरी करे की बासी चाग्री कोरुत वल्ते सेंटारे मनेर सुखे तादेर संसार चले भालो मोने पोनेरो तारी के फिरी बे बाडी फोने ते बोलीलो एगारोई सेप्टेम्बरे दीदी तो किंतु अल्लाह देने वाला होते पड़े ना अल्लाह गुनालिक भें ये ये तुम उन्हें बोल चुके तो आवार भेबे तो है इतना जल्द पिकर तो अल्लाह अल्लाह तो बोला था नहीं जब वही बच्चा को वही जो छेले में रा और अभी खुरे है ना संसार तो चला तो पाची नहीं अभी आमा पाँच पाँच छोड़ा छेले में आमी वही बच्चा लोग के भी खा कूटते पढ़ालाम बाक आठ गुड़ते पढ़ालाम की घुटो गुड़ते पढ़ालाम अमी तार जोड़नो नहीं दे पाची तो शे अमी ताके दुटो भालो भावे खबाते पाची शे जोरे जलाए हुं कुरे वाई तो पड़ी ही आची 
তো সেটা কি আল্লাহ গুনাহ করবেন So I want to uh, start by discussing um, some of the editing choices. Um, so the film opens with the um, scroll of uh, September 11th. Um, and even though uh, it's clearly not a traditional topic, um, I think um, doing that um, uh, I thought was important for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, um, I think it's great for the audience to experience um, the singing scroll um, as close to it would be experienced by, um, uh, by, by an audience member um, traditionally. And a lot of the stories that were being saw, uh, sung about are stories that, that most people uh, knew. And um, knowing the story, um, one can really um, appreciate uh, looking at the, um, the scroll as it's rolled up um, and, um, and, and, and um, it, you know, having familiarity allows us to just be immersed in the performance. Um, and uh, I thought that that was um, really important. Um, I, I love the art form and it, it's almost like a proto cinema um, in the way that the images roll past us um, as the story is told. Um, the other aspect of this, um, you know, as a setup um, is that um, the uh, uh, performer is a man um, and traditionally all of the performers were male. But, um, but what this film is about is, is a, a collective of, of women who have started um, uh, performing, painting, uh, making these scrolls, and, um, and it's really changed um, their, uh, their, their lives, um, as you've seen, in terms of um, uh, they're bringing more money in, they're getting more independence, um, you know, um, and, and that changes some of the dynamics um, socially. Uh, so I thought it was, it was good to start with, um, with a man um, you know, more traditional and then move on to, um, to our subject matter, um, which was, uh, which is this, this group of women's collective of women. Um, the next section, um, uh, with the woman, um, making her paints, um, uh, I feel like this, uh, once again, um, was a nice, uh, scene to follow that initial song. Um, you know, the song is very, um, intriguing and very engaging. And, um, in a way this sets a, a different pace. Um, things slow down. Um, we're now observing um, the making of these uh, these paints, which I find just fascinating, and I think brings us into um, you know their world. Um, that the the craft that goes into this and what these women had to um, learn and master in order to take on this art form um, is fairly significant, um, and that gives us a, a nice transition um, into starting to meet the women. Um, and learn more about the scrolls. Um, what's interesting also is that the scrolls, um, the, uh, you know, it was traditionally, um, you know, all stories that were more, um, you know, religiously inspired or, 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 or had been known as, as, as stories. Um, but um, topics now have become more um, uh, socially relevant. Um, there's, there's um, you know, songs about, um, you know, HIV and AIDS, and there's songs about um, you know, um, uh, mistreatment of, of women um, and other kind of social issues. Um, and um, so uh, the idea of the editing was to bring you into the world, introduce you to the art form, and then to bring us into the women and to see the impact um, that working, um, that taking on this work and, uh, and adopting this art form, um, the changes that it's made in their lives. So that's, that's really it for my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions about um, singing pictures or, or any of the films, filmmakers or clips um, that we've seen.